Good night, everybody, and welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study. As you could see from the opening screen, we are just off the cusp of the most celebrated time in Christianity, which is Easter Sunday and Holy Week. And as you can imagine, Easter Sunday culminates the seasons of Lent and Easter, and of course, is the ending of Holy Week. It exemplifies the triumph that Jesus made of a sin and the grave and how Jesus bore a heavy cost in order to allow us to gain some things. However, please note that these things were foretold before he even came. And also that he himself predicted and said that these things would happen. So we're going to explore that tonight in this talk about Jesus' death and resurrection called He is Risen. But before that all begins, let us, as usual, have a little bit of a song and then a prayer. And then we'll get right into Tuesday night Bible study. All the time. Jesus, we thank you so much that we are able to come to the very fullness of knowing why you came on earth as we celebrate this season of Easter. Let us have Holy Week throughout all of the weeks of our lives, where we reflect on your goodness and your majesty and your grace, where we reflect on your, your love despite the, the agonies of the trial and the sufferings that you face, we reflect on your power, where we reflect on your truth and the meaning of who you are to us, the God of the earth, 
who is always looking out for our regard and ready to allow us to come into the, the fullness of who we can be through you. All these things we speak tonight and uh, pray and lift up your name and honor you for. Amen. How is everybody doing? Good night. I am as ever brother Johnny German Alcock. Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study. We are the Hillshire United Church. You are streaming this probably somewhere on your YouTube or if possible on Facebook. Um, please do put in the likes on the the, the um, platform that you may be on and share it with somebody. You could put it in your WhatsApp as a link, either in the status or just share the link to somebody or some group that you're in. Also, if you're on YouTube, you can click the subscribe button and also uh, even put off a little clip of this when it is finished and put it on your own YouTube. Please do also click the notification bell so you're notified every time we have a session like this. We usually have Bible studies every Tuesday night at uh, 7.30 p.m. and we stream our Sunday services um, or Facebook page at 9 a.m. Thank you, everybody. What a holy week that was. We had so many different uh, sessions and sermons and uh, different celebratory times. And we had a lot of time to reflect on God doing his thing, right? Remember also that on Saturdays we have prayer and fasting, 7 to 9 a.m. in the morning. And the church school is on. It happens every time church is going on currently. We're back to how we usually do it uh, since the pandemic's uh, and also note that our auxiliaries usually meet sometime between Friday and Mondays. Please do reach out to your um, representatives for each of these different things to talk and uh, stay together as we would in our men's and women's fellowship. All protocols observed. We had a great time, right? We had a bit of reflection on some of the things in relation to Christianity and who God is and what he's about and uh, why he came on earth, why he had to die, what his resurrection represents. Um, what is this thing about the uh, holiness of God? How does it reflect on us? How is it that his uh, death uh, means that we now can be transformed to come into his righteousness. Little themes like that are all throughout the Easter period. And what I want to reflect on tonight is that his death and resurrection, though it seemed shocking to the persons who were alive while he was there, the ones who were closest to him, his disciples, was something that was predicted, not only during the time that he was there, because he said it to them multiple times, but long before Jesus came. In fact, the entire truth of Jesus is um, radiating brightly throughout the entire Old Testament. You can look and you will see scriptures in relation to um, his, his dawn, what, what it will mean, why he must come. We read that first in Genesis chapter 3, right after um, God started to give Adam and Eve some commands and some things that would happen because they had sinned and disobeyed him. We, where it says that the, the serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of Eve, but then that seed, same seed will stump on the serpent and uh, trample on him with his feet. This is a reference, of course, to how Jesus would come as a man on earth, but he's God, which is the seed of Eve. But he will also be able to conquer this same issue of sin and death and allow us to also come into the fullness of what um, our real inheritance represents. But then there are references also to his birth. There are references to what type of person he will be. There are references to his ministry. There are references to his uh, death and resurrection. And of course, the references to the, the things in relation to what all of these things mean and what we should do to now live up our lives, to want to represent 
the one who created us and you know bought us with a purchase. If we are unsure of these things, then let's read it in our Bibles. Because our Bibles are the guide posts or the, the manual, so to speak, that will help us to see how is it that Jesus did some of the things that he did. And why is it, for example, while he was on the road to Emmaus with the two disciples and said to them, how foolish it was of you seeing these things happen to Jesus and becoming downhearted, not knowing that these things were supposed to happen to exemplify or manifest who Jesus was. This is what he said to them. And he was saying that these all these things were in the law were reflected in the, the Psalms and in the prophets. So, if we presume that you know, we, we, some people have a wrong view of what the Bible is, not knowing that most of the Old Testament and the things were there long before, that is of course how people in the New Testament were repeating things that they knew of written before and were reflecting in parts of the New Testament. That is why it is that when the, the Magi came asking, where is it that they said that um, this king will be born? That the people who were there who were um, advising King Herod at the time knew that it is said that the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. It is said so in, in books in the Old Testament. So we have to understand. And, and when it is that, for example, the Apostle John, John the Baptist, John the Revelator, said they were asking him, who is it that you are? Are you this Jeremiah? Are you the Messiah who is to come? And he said that he was the one in the wilderness making way the way plain for the God who will come. And he was repeating something from the Old Testament as well. God's plans and his visions for mankind are always being revealed over time through history. What happens is that many times it, it doesn't become fully plain until a bit more exploration, explanation of it comes to be. It also sometimes is not even realized until it actually happens right in front of our eyes, as you could see through the disciples, and it is explained over and over and over again. That is how life is. Even some of the, the things that we do in our own lives, many times it takes three, four, five, six times for us to do it, to go through the routine of figuring it out, to understand how one thing correlates to the next and how we relate from one place to the next. That is how our whole lives are. So don't be surprised by how it is. I'm going to explain and it's become very clear. How in, in fact, Jesus himself said that he would die and rise again multiple times. And also that it was reflected in the scriptures. You just have to read it properly to understand what it meant. So when you have your issues, especially doubts about God or, or maybe your faith, or how you're going to go through some things and have God assist you through them, don't be surprised when you go through those seasons because the disciples had the same issues. And don't be surprised when you see others who are around you, if you are more spiritual and mature, have these same issues. Because even the disciples who are around Jesus all the time had the same issues. And even at the point when he was risen again, 10 men and whoever else was in the room said to Thomas, look, we saw Jesus and he was risen. And Thomas came, and he was not there at the time, and said, unless I see God with the nails and the things there imprinted in him, I don't think I'm going to believe. Why? Because nowhere else in the history of man has anybody been ever raised from the dead of their own accord. Elijah raised um, somebody from the dead, as well as Elisha, right? And throughout Jewish history, it is said that Moses' body was resurrected up to be with God, right? And Elijah and you know, Enoch were translated to, to be with God. But 
this sort of thing, this sort of miracle, which is exactly what it is, is unheard of. Um, many times misunderstood. And of course, you know, it's kind of uh, in, inconceivable, in, indescribable also to be old. So let's go through some of the rudiments of these things. The first thing I'm going to read is Psalm 118, which talks about the fact that, you know, God could not die. Let's let's read some parts of it. Let me try to project it on the screen. How are we doing? Please remember if you have any questions that you please put it in the chat section. And even if you're watching it after it has live stream, please do also um, ensure that you put it in there because we always check back and answer questions and no respond. You can also note that Also note that we have a WhatsApp group, so you can even um, join that group and see all of the messages in relation to the church there. And um, let's have a good time always talking about God and fellowshiping and growing together. So it says in Psalm 118 that we should give thanks to the Lord for his good, his, mercy, his love endures forever, right? And that the very nature of of him will say, let the Israel say, his love endures forever. Right? Let us scroll further down to the parts in um, verses 14 to 24, which has the pertinent part about the fact that uh, God could not die. Let's scroll on a little bit here. Where it says this, The Lord is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Shouts of joy and victory resound in the tents of the righteous. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely. But he has not given me over to death. Those two verses are the pertinent one, verses 17 to 18. Open for me the gates of the righteous. I will enter and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this. And it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. So you see how in verses 17 to 18, it reflects on the nature of God as one who cannot die. It, it says, let me repeat what it says. It says, I will not die but live. I will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chastened me severely but he has not given me over to death. This is a prophetic bit of psalm, right, in relation to how God's right hand, if you look very closely now, where it's reading from verses 14 to 15 to 16, it's saying that the Lord's right hand, who David said at one point, the Lord said unto my Lord, let my right, you know, sit until I make my enemies my footstool, sorry about that, right? So it is in relation to Jesus who is on the throne, on the right hand of the Father, as is described both in the Old Testament and the New, who will become the greatness of the fullness of the Godhead to rule all things, right? The, the three members of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, work in consort. It is a mystery which we cannot understand fully because God is God, right? God is one being, but it's like three separate or distinct entities which operate and do different things. So Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Son. The Father is not the Spirit, and the Father is not the Son. But they are all God. 
one God, but it's through different representations of who it can be. So when this psalm starts to describe that the Lord's right hand, we know right off the bat they're representing the Messiah, the Son of God, the Anointed One, right? And then it goes down. So, so you see, you know, sometimes we quote this psalm and we kind of reflect it to talk a lot about our lives and you know, we go through some of the struggles in relation to, to uh, the sufferings and the trials of, of our lives. But it was really referencing Jesus because it says the Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die but live and will proclaim what the Lord has done. The Lord has chased me severely, but he has not given me over to death. So we reference and see that there are some things there that say that maybe a death may happen, but it may not be a death. He cannot die because he's God who is a spirit who created and made everything. He cannot die because he is the Alpha as well as the last, the Omega. He is the first of all things. He cannot die because as the right hand of God, he is to bring all salvation and he's your strength. And he will bring the fullness of the Godhead to men's minds. And he will also be able to transform men's hearts. Watch what happens now on this Easter Sunday millennia ago where John and Peter and Mary and the other ladies and everybody was just astonished that um, they, they didn't quite understand what Jesus had said. I'll go through some of the things Jesus said soon too. And saw an empty tomb and they, they, they just didn't get it. What is this all about? So let's read John 20 from verse 1 or so. Early on the first day of the week, but it was still dark. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciples. The other Jesus, the, the one Jesus loved, of course, is represented of John, who sometimes called himself the beloved, or the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple overran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen laying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand. I wanted to look at this verse here that says they still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. All right, we'll go back to that in a minute. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. Then asked her, woman, why are you crying? They asked her, sorry. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. She said, Sir, you have carried him away. Tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I am not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples.
So we get the story here of the disciples saying to Mary, you know, what's this? What are what are these things you're saying where you've seen Jesus as well as angels there and that the tomb was open? When they went, they saw them for themselves and um, were astonished. The reason why is they did not understand the scripture. And we'll get to some of those scriptures in a minute. But what is also startling is that Jesus himself said to them that he would die, get into some trouble with the people in the Iraq, in, in the Jerusalem area, and also rise again, right? So if it is that you don't get this, you miss the point of the fact that Jesus is in charge of all things, understands all things, and rules. And you miss the fact also that he knew that he would die and did it willingly anyways. And you miss the fact also that if he knew he would die, he knew the manner of the, the scourging and the beating and the stuff that would happen. There are parts in Isaiah that speak to the fact that he would be mocked and spit at and his beard will be pulled. And we're getting about Isaiah 50 or so. There are parts in a psalm, which I'm going to mention soon, which gives very weirdly details about the fact that he will, you know, be warning about being forsaken, as well as that they will even cast lots uh, for his clothing. That is much too much detail for you to be, you know, just pondering and worrying and saying, well, is Jesus really so and did it really happen so? The Psalms were written millennia before Jesus himself came on the earth in a physical format. And if there is a Psalm, as Jesus said, you will hear about, I have not come to dispel anything, but to fulfill the laws and the prophets. And if David, in a great vision through his um, thirst to be with God and know more about him, could write these things long before Jesus himself came, then we have to start looking closely now and saying, who is this Jesus really? What does he mean to me? And, and what does it mean for me to have somebody who has done these things? And what is my response? How should I live my life in response to this sort of thing coming from a God who knows all these things and yet still love me enough to go through it anyways? The concordant scripture in Matthew 28, 1 to 10 tells a very similar story about the fact that Jesus knew about these things. In verses 5 to 6, I'm not going to read the entire thing, just for time's sake. It says, The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. So, in one reference, it says they didn't understand the scriptures, you know. So it, it's leading us to realize that there's some things in the Old Testament that leads us to know that he would go through these things lying and then become resurrected. And then there's another reference that shows us that he himself, Jesus, said that these things would happen. So let's explore some of these things right now. How are we doing? Have any questions as yet? If you do, please put it in the chat. Please also. Uh, like this um, video and share it with one of your friends and uh, put it in your WhatsApp or on your Facebook or maybe even on your YouTube if you want and we share it. Thanks always for joining us for Tuesday Night Bible Study. So for the parts in relation to the fact that Jesus um, is referenced as not being understood as coming from the scriptures from before, as he himself said to the men on the road to Emmaus. We already read in Psalm 118, verses 17 to 18 or so, where it says, 
that I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. But there are other scriptures that relate to how there may be a seemingly part of a death, but that he will rise again. The apostles and those who were closest to him should have been weary to realize this because he himself raised people from the dead. He raised Lazarus from the dead four days after it is that he was in, you know, in the grave. In fact, at one point he and Mary and Martha were discussing and they themselves said that they believed that he was the Messiah who would be able to resurrect them on the last day. And then Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, you know, will have the eternal life. But those who believe even in this life will also have greater life given to them in, in a resurrected way. So they understood it. They seemed to understand it in theory. But when it did eventually happen, they were flabbergasted, fearful, in awe, um, unsure, um, just worried about these things. But it was real. This was the Messiah. This was the Son of God. This was the real one who would come to show them some things. So let us get a little deeper in some of these um, Old Testament scriptures which I'm about to read. So Psalm 16, verse 20, sorry, not 20, verse 10 says this. Because he will not abandon me, let me project it, to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful ones decay. And it says below that, you will make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. So, another version, the KJV, I'm reading from it, and he says, you will not allow your Holy One to see corruption, right? We all know that one of the obvious things that happen to every man is that he will die. But what Jesus allows and shows us is that death is but a sleep, a rest. I mentioned Lazarus rising from the dead, but he also raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. And he also raised um, the son of a widow in name from the dead. He is the master of life and death. And if we can understand this, we will have no fear of death, no fear of man, and trust in God to lead us in our lives to a resurrected, um, fulfilling, abundant life here, but also that when we um, move on to the great by and by, we will have trust that God is the one who will raise us back up on the last day. So it says, I will not suffer my Holy One. Which other Holy One could they mean by these verses? It must be the Messiah. It must be the one who is on the right hand of God, as the psalmist has always been saying. It must be the Son of God. It must be God himself. And we know that this is what it's represented because Peter himself said the same thing in the Acts of the Apostles. So when it is that Pentecost came, 40 days, 50 days later, after it is that Jesus was crucified and uh, died and then he was raised again, we know that there came a time when Pentecost came and the Holy Spirit came down from heaven and uh, started to fill the believers and give them even more revelations of the things that are. And what happened is that the Apostle Peter stood up and gave a great sermon and 3,000 persons were saved. And he referenced something from the psalm which we mentioned already, that God would sit on the Lord's right and make his enemies his footstool. He mentioned something from Joel in relation to the energy and the power that the Holy Spirit would give believers 
And he also mentioned this, which you just said from Psalm 16, verse 10. And uh, you will reference it and see it in Acts chapter 2, around verse 27. It actually is repeated twice. Let me project the screen to show you. So it is seen here in Acts chapter 2, verse 27, where it says, Therefore my heart declares and my tongue rejoices, my body will also be left simple, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your holy one see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Peter here is quoting the same thing which we just read in Psalm chapter 16. And then he explains it by saying, Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. David is the one who wrote this specific psalm that we're referencing. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see the king. Right from the mouth of an apostle. Right from the mouth of somebody who saw Jesus. Right from the mouth of somebody who was taught by Jesus. Right from the mouth of somebody who saw Jesus led away to be crucified and also saw him when he was resurrected. They did not understand the scripture it is referenced. And so we have to go back to it to see what they missed at the time. Some of us, unfortunately, also still miss it. In Psalm 22, David again, before he starts to speak about, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. In Psalm 23, gives us a great demonstration of the fullness of um, what God represents in Psalm 22, in a psalm that talks about the fullness of God about to be crucified. And if, let me project that, in Psalm 22, it talks very plainly, right talk about by saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the cries of my anguish? Jesus himself in Aramaic quoted this first phrase here by saying, hello, hello, lama sabachthani, right? It goes down further by talking about the Holy One who would be despised and scorned and mocked. Who people will surround about like lions or like the bulls. And that his bones will almost feel as if they're out of joint. And his mouth will be dried up like poster, just describing some of the thirst that he felt while he was on the cross and was there for, for six hours, right? And then it says here that they pierce his hands and his feet. And everything was on display for people to see. And they stared and gloated at him. And then there is a startling phrase that said, they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. What else could this psalm be talking about? apart from the things that happened at the crucifixion and the scenes around there. Let's look at another psalm. Psalm 31 describes something in relation to the, um, the same issues of the time with the shame and the disgrace that Jesus felt and his afflictions. Let me, let me project parts of it. And uh, if we look closely, because of all my enemies, it said in verse 11, I am the utter content of my neighbors and an object of dread to my closest friends. Those who see me on the street flee from me. For I hear many whispering, terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. Sounds very much like Jesus' time, right? The times of him 
being conspired against in the Sanhedrin and those who wanted to kill him, as well as when he was about to die and be crucified, how the disciples from fear and worry for their lives ran when the cohort of soldiers came and took Jesus and put him before the courts to be tried. And it is all there in relation to what would happen at the points in time surrounding Jesus. Let us look at Job 19, because it then gives us a bigger clue than we projected from about verses 23 to 27. That shows us this. Oh, that my words were recorded that they were written on a scroll, that they were inscribed in an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. This is a brilliant description of a resurrected king who will come and also resurrect those who believe in him and are of him. Why would he say redeemer or reference that person as a vindicator? Why would he even say that he knows that he lives if it is that there was not some sort of bad thing that was going to happen to him before her? that time, right? Why would he say that he will see him with his own eyes if we're not promised a time to be with God? We will see the fullness of an eternity. All explained, said Jesus. They did not understand the scripture, said the references in John. And then we also get this queer phrase in Matthew that says that as I read, he has risen just as he said. So Jesus himself predicted his resurrection in multiple ways. I'm going to go through a few of them. You know, Jesus, at the point when Peter confessed that he was Christ, gave them a foreview into his agony and his eventual death and resurrection. After his transfiguration, he did the same thing. Before he entered into Jerusalem on one of the last times in the final part of his life, he said the same thing. At the point when he you know, was in a bit of a discussion with the scribes and the Pharisees, he referenced the temple and how it would be rebuilt over time. Through him, of course. And uh, gave them subtle references to him. But it was solid enough that they themselves came back and said, you know, this fraud, this guy said that he was going to rise again after three days. We have to ensure that nothing happens, that his disciples don't take his body and um, make it seem as if he's risen again. Or else the second sin will be worse than the first one, which we killed him for. I'll show you where that is referenced also. And he also made comparison between himself and Jonah, right? So Jesus was all either very plain with what he said to his disciples who were the closest to him, or using parables and speaking about his eventual resurrection three days after. To many people, it wasn't something that he was trying to hide. Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 says, uh, let me look for it. And you can see the um, the other concordant verses that say more or less the same thing. It says this, from that time on, that time being after um, Peter reflected and said, yes, he realized he was the Christ. Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hand of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Very clear, very well written out. 
You can see it also in Mark chapter 8, as you see on your screen, verses 31 to 32. You also see it in Luke chapter 9, verses 21 to 22. At other points, Jesus saw Elijah and Moses, and had a little bit, bit of a meeting with them, right? And it was sometime after this that he cast out a demon out of a, a possessed boy. And then he gives them even more thoughts about this same issue which we just said. And he says this in verses 22 to 23 of Matthew 17. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. It is also references Mark chapter 9, verse 32, Luke chapter 9, verses 43 to 45. And then the third time now, he's about to go into Jerusalem. And uh, he predicts his death in the NIV. It actually shows that this is the third time he's saying it. A third time. Verses 17 to 19 say, Now Jesus was going up to Jerusalem on the way. He took the twelve aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death And will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day he will be raised to life. Three times. It is also referenced in Mark chapter 10 verses 32 to 34. Luke chapter 18 verses 31 to 34. Three times Jesus plainly says this to his disciples. Yet at the point when it did happen. They didn't quite realize that this is what Jesus meant. I want you to use this as an example that God will say and show you many things through his word or through persons who are a little older than you are more spiritually mature. And you should discern it, use the Bible and figure out what is right and what is wrong. And understand that God still speaks, God still heals, God still goes into the broken places in our lives. God is still a, a provider. God is still somebody who is able to assist us through life. We've got to understand this. We've got to see God as one who is out to assist us. John chapter 2 now gives this reference where he starts to speak to the scribes and Pharisees about the same thing, where it says in verse 18, the Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all these things? This was a point, at a point where he came and he dismantled the market and the people around and said, You made my you know, house a den of thieves. Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple. I will raise it again in three days. We know, of course, that the Pharisees, let me read it, make it even plainer. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So to prove to you that these men understood exactly what Jesus meant, not his disciples, but the men who were quarreling with him or disputing with him. Let us look at Matthew 27, where at Jesus' death, you know, they decided that they were going to say, but be careful enough, because if it is that this man, Jesus, they thought he was a man, does what he says he is going to do then there is going to be an issue. Because now it is that he's going to prove the fullness of who he said he was. 
And I want you to know that when you yourself go through some things in your life, which you must, that the fights that you may feel or the stresses and the trials you go through are a testing for you to prove and glorify God. It is after some things happen that seem impossible to others, but you know can be through God, that you show God for who he really is. Let's read this. Verses 62 to 64. The next day from Matthew 27. The one after preparation day. Let me project the screen. The chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, the disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. So it's clear that even though he spoke in a parabolic manner and spoke about building the temple in three days, that they knew and understood just exactly what he was about. He also referenced being in the belly of the whale like Jonah for three days, as him being in the earth, in the grave for three days. We will see that in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, Matthew chapter 16, verse 4, and Luke chapter 11, verses 29 to 32. They, of course, again, are seeking a sign from him to say what is his that will prove that you are the Messiah or the one who will come or the Son of God, right? They thought he would come with great pomp and would lead and, you know, dismantle some things. That he would um, be kind of like them, like a lawyer or a scribe or something. Um, you know, just doing some things. They just totally misunderstood what God was about. Make it worse. He was going to the worst of the worst, the downtrodden, the lepers, the prostitutes, the publicans, the tax collectors, and all those who people look down on, and trying to show them more about what the kingdom represented, and healing those who people probably would not have turned on to assist. And so they did the counter of what they thought the righteous life meant, which was actually love and mercy and forgiveness and they missed it because they misread the law and so as they ask all the time for this sign Jesus says a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Heart of the earth, sorry. And uh, be careful what he says, because he says, Now the men of Nineveh will stand in judgment to you, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now somebody greater than Jonah is here. And the queen of the south will rise in judgment too, because she repented and listened to Solomon and his wisdom, and a greater than Solomon is here. We have to see Jesus for who he is and who he says he is. We have to see Jesus closer and closer. There are other subtle references in the book of John, John 12, 78, John 13, verse 33, and John 14, verse 25, which speaks to the fact that Jesus said he would either be buried and or he will go on to another place different from this. John 13, 33 and 14, 25 speak to him saying, I, places I will go to you cannot go. John 12, 17, 8 speaks on the fact of how the lady came with the alabaster box and perfumed his feet and his, um, you know, washed him. And he said, this is done for my burial. Why would he say that if he did not know he would die? 
And why would he reference going to places that the disciples could not go immediately if he did not know he would be resurrected or would have to call back up everybody with him as well? We have to come into our Bible and look at it for what it really is. And we should know God enough to see him closely for who he really is. Can we really, during this Holy Week, reflect on a God who, who already said and did the things which he said he would do? And all that is left now is for us to believe that what was represented in the law and the Psalms and the prophets and from Jesus' own mouth himself is a brilliant representation of the gospel message, which I will repeat very quickly from Acts chapter 10, verses 34, where it says this, Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the gospel message. May it resonate in your hearts as we pray for you tonight. Lord Jesus, help us to see you as the God who has died and been resurrected on our behalf. Help us to be transformed in our mind and our hearts and to live our lives to the fullness of this resurrection and what it means. Help us, God, to know you as the true and holy one who will not see corruption but also resurrect us. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for Tuesday night Bible study. We are, as ever, the Elsha United Church. And we are pastored by the great Reverend Carlington King. Next week, we will go into the scriptures in John chapter 20 and talk a little bit about some things that happened, uh, you know, after the resurrection time or around the same time period. And we'll come to a part that talks about, you know, those who believe because Thomas realized some things afterwards. But then Jesus said this. Because you have seen, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. So we will talk about blessed are those who believe. Thank you everybody for joining us for Tuesday Night Bible Study. Please do join us next time. And remember, share this with a friend. And know that the resurrection of Christ teaches us that the very nature of him will resurrect our lives and also see us through the end of time.